Hey, hi everyone. You're very welcome to our discussion today. This is um, a talk with Professor Hurst Hannam at Trinity College Dublin. So my name is Donna Lyons. I'm with the School of Law in Trinity College. This is seminar 18 in our speaker series. Um, I'm really delighted to be speaking with Professor Hurst Hannam today, who is Professor Emeritus of International Law at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University in Massachusetts. Professor Hurst's focus is on human rights and its role in international legal and political order. His scholarly work has been complemented by service as a consultant and advisor to a number of intergovernmental and non-governmental organizations, including the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, and the Department of Political Affairs. He's also been counsel in complaints before European, inter-American and UN human rights bodies. Professor Hannam is the author or editor of numerous books and articles on international law and human rights, including International Human Rights Problems of Law, Policy and Process, as well as Negoti Negotiating Self-Determination and Guide to International Human Rights Practice, in addition to Autonomy, Sovereignty and Self-Determination, the Accommodation of Conflicting Rights. So just some of his excellent publications. And today we are discussing rescuing human rights, a radically moderate approach. This is something I did a book review of last year. Um, so I, I found it very instructive and very informative. And as you know, um, I agreed with, with much of what you wrote, Professor Hannam. So um, I'll just read a brief quote to introduce the book and then uh, we'll discuss that. And then we'll bring in questions um, after our discussion. So on page three, you note that Academics and pundits now reflect on the limits, twilight or end times of human rights, the demise of the last utopia or their very survival, the more generous right about human rights being at a crossroads or in crisis and right that now is the time for asking hard questions, examining critical perspectives or imagining various kinds of human rights futures, many of them problematic. What went wrong? Is the very concept of universal rights becoming irrelevant even as the world becomes increasingly interconnected? Were human rights always too idealistic to survive the economic and political shocks of the past decade? Or have they been, quote, subsumed by the politics of American power and market-based democratic liberalism? Should we abandon legalistic references to rights? In favor of concentrating on such pressing matters as climate change, sustainable development, corruption, and the increasing polarization of the body politic, and just to skip a little bit, um, you ask a few more questions and then you say, it is the thesis of this book that human rights are not only relevant, but essential as we move fully into the 21st century. I hope to counter those who deny the existence or importance of human rights, educate those who view human rights too narrowly by excluding economic, social and cultural rights and or reasonable interpretive expansions of norms that were formulated decades ago and discourage those who unthinkingly or irresponsibly expand the idea of human rights in ways that undermine their originally more modest purpose. Human rights properly understood are indeed universally applicable and their abandonment would be an un unconscionable rejection of the simple proposition that all human beings share fundamental rights to be respected and ensured by their governments. So thereafter you talk about uh, becoming more realistic idealists as human rights practitioners and scholars. Would you like to elaborate on that idea um, using any examples you like? And then, and then we'll talk about, about the book, maybe chapter by chapter. Well, I haven't uh, read the book for quite some time, although I probably <laughs> had much of it memorized. But I'm glad that page three does such a good job of describing what comes next, because if people don't want to read the whole thing, that's probably a good, a good summary. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, the book, actually was in gestation for about a decade and comes not just because of the Trumps and the Orbans and the Dutertes of the world, but because there really did seem to me to be a problem with both the expansion of rights and the conflation of rights which other thing, with other things that might be absolutely as important, but nonetheless were quite different. And I think what perhaps is unique about uh, my book is that it's the only one that I know of that is highly critical in many ways of what the direction in which human rights have taken over the past 10 or 20 years. 
but that does seek to rescue them rather than to abandon them. I mean, the Eric Posner's and the Stephen Hopgood's and the Sam Moines of the world basically want to give up and pretend that development, which over the last 50 years has received hundreds of billions of dollars and not worked very well, or something else, should take over for this failed human rights project. Many of those critics equate the failure with the failure of the International Criminal Court yeah. or the failure to stop wars. Well, neither of those things was ever within the scope of human rights. Yeah. And so my hope is to, to come back to this notion that human rights isn't everything. And just by chance, I looked at my email this morning and uh, another former student uh, who just received her degree uh, having uh, completed her thesis a few years after she graduated, um, sent me an extract from an article by uh, Professor John Tassiulis, who you may know of, who is a professor of ethics and legal philosophy at, at Oxford. And he is writing something in Eon, um, a, a newsletter I haven't heard before. But he quotes in turn uh, the late moral philosopher James Griffin in a book published in 2008 on human rights. And I will quote you the only sentence that he quoted, which is, I think, to me, a perfect encapsulation of, of what I believed and one reason I wrote the book. Um, and that is that it is a great but now common mistake to think that because we see rights as especially important in morality, we must make everything especially important in morality into a right. And I think that is the essence, that rights are different from morality, that law is different from politics. All these things are related and law shouldn't be sanctified and human rights aren't today what they will be in 20 or 40 or 50 years. But nonetheless, those differences are important and I think they will, recognizing them will enable us to make better use of human rights and also will force us to deal with many of the complicated problems in the world, uh, having to do with economics and inequality and the environment and artificial intelligence um, in ways that turn to ethics and morality and economists, instead of looking to make everything rights, uh, because rights are about law and not everything good or important in the world has to do with law. Yes, thank you. And so fascinating. And we'll come back to the distinction between um, enforcement and um, more kind of softer forms of, of uh, social policy. Before we do that, um, so in chapter two, and it's something you just mentioned, you talk about international criminal justice and how scholars and practitioners have made the mistake of conflating international crimes with human rights and that that can lead to a kind of a delegitimization or undermining of the human rights project. Is there is there anything further you wanted to say on that before we talk about other areas of conflation between rights and policy? Well, the only point I would make is that I do think that one day we will look back at the creation of the International Criminal Court as a landmark, at least an attempt to bring universal accountability to some of the perpetrators of the worst crimes. But to be realistic, the ICC has not exactly covered itself in glory and since its creation. Yeah. It's very expensive. It seems to have accomplished relatively little. Um, it also has an impossible task. In some ways, it's doomed to fail. Yeah. And its real purpose, and in this, I think it may be succeeding a bit, is to goad domestic governments into punishing their own criminals mm -hmm. so they don't have to end up in the court. Yeah. Um, some of my criticism, though, I confess is selfish because I think that, as I just suggested earlier, human rights have been somewhat tarred with the difficulties and, if not the failures, of the ICC. Mm -hmm. And the road ahead for human rights is difficult enough, particularly these days. Yeah. Um, and the goals are different. Um, International criminal law deals with a tiny, tiny little subset, subset of bad things that people do, very bad things that people do. Mm -hmm. 
And their purpose is to find people individually criminally accountable. That's worlds away from the goal of human rights law, which is to hold governments, not people, to particular standards, to encourage universality, and to deal with a, an extraordinary range of issues, uh, none of which uh, fall within the purview of, of criminal law. So both are good, and I don't want to diminish the importance of criminal law, but it's just not the same thing. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And it's so important, as you do, to make that distinction between human rights um, being obligations, or international human rights anyway, being obligations on state actors and governments, as opposed to um, on the individuals, but also the distinction, again, between obligations on individuals and individual criminal responsibility, which leads to, you know, prison time um, and um, yeah, the, the legacy issues of, of having a criminal penalty imposed, which is so different to a rights violation. So it's something that I think people sometimes struggle to grasp, but it's important to point out. Um, so if we're talking about conf conflation then between human rights um, and other areas of social policy, so in chapters three and four, you discuss the, the difficulties or the challenges of conflating human rights with recent attempts to oblige businesses to act more responsibly. And then in chapter four, you talk about the conflation between rights and trade and globalization um, and the environment, corruption and technology. Um, and obviously, um, you, you think that these are challenges that need to be addressed, but not through rights. Is, would you like to talk about more, a bit more about the, the difficulty or the problems with conflating those two things? Well, I think we need to understand what human rights can and, and cannot do. And to offer you another example, uh, this time from The Guardian yesterday, I, Guess I've been keeping up better with the news than I thought. Mm -hmm. But there was an article about uh, the Glencore Corporation, mm -hmm. uh, which apparently was responsible for a major oil spill or something like that in Chad. Mm -hmm. And so there was an appeal to the OECD and the UK was trying to pressure Glencore to do something about this issue. And the headline was human rights violations in Chad by, by Glencore. Mm -hmm. Now, again, there's no question that companies should be held responsible for the harms that they cause. That's called tort law. I assume we have a few lawyers in the audience and you can't just do anything you want. Um, but there are two problems with this, with the creation of what now is an entirely new industry, uh, which is human rights advisors to companies and compliance officers who work for companies. Um, this isn't going to go away because there's too much money involved in it now, frankly. But we're doing two things. One is that we're holding businesses insufficiently accountable for the harms that they cause. Uh, if they hurt anyone, whether it's an accident or whether it's uh, negligent or whether it's reckless, they should be held accountable. Uh, we should also expect businesses to do good things to support charities, uh, to give scholarships to the, the sons and daughters of their employees to help them get a better education, et cetera, et cetera. So the whole idea of corporate social responsibility, which is much broader than what we would say they have in terms of human rights obligations, yeah. uh, is essential. The other, maybe somewhat more theoretical, but still to me important distinction or, or problem is that conflating the international law, the binding obligations that governments have with respect to human rights with what are in every case, when we're talking about corporations, non-binding voluntarily, often self-written guidelines um, developed by business itself uh, does a disservice to human rights and frankly gives credibility to a process that in many cases, I think, is designed to make corporations look better rather than to make them act better. Mm -hmm. And so again, go after the companies, we should do that. We should go after them to, to, to pay a, a meaningful wage. Um, but don't pretend that they have human rights obligations that extend to all human rights, which is exactly the way mm 
all of the treaties, or no, or sorry, there are no treaties yet, all of the declarations and other materials have been written because they don't have anything to do with education or fair trials or elections, at least they shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the conjunction does no good for, for either one. Um, I mean, just to talk briefly, probably the most difficult issue for me in terms of opposing the conflation of human rights with other things is perhaps the environment. Now, human rights already does deal with environmental degradation because the human, there's a human right to life and there's a human right to health. And human rights bodies and writers uh, have used these two rights, which we can understand, um, and applied them to situations in which the environment was the cause uh, of violations of the right to health or the right to life. There was government involvement because that's what's required by human rights norms. Um, if there we were to proclaim that there was a human right to a healthy environment, it might not be the worst thing in the world. But given all the effort that's going into doing this, if all that effort were going into some more realistic way of dealing with the environment, I think we'd accomplish more. If the effort on the part of human rights people were going into something that was more realistic, I think it would be more useful. Uh, John Knox, who was the first uh, special rapporteur on human rights and the environment, is a very thoughtful person. I don't know him well, but we've had a few chats. And I once said to him that as long as he could guarantee that everyone would read all of his reports to the General Assembly before they gave any thought to what the human, the human right to a healthy environment would encompass, then it would be fine because he does an excellent job of setting out all the problems. He then comes out on the side of proclaiming that right to a healthy environment. We know, however, that that's not going to happen. And when you think of what we need to do about the environment, what we need to know about science and economics and politics and dis disparate impact on different groups of people in different countries, and then when you add to that the fact that you're then going to go, what, you're going to go to China and Russia and Brazil and say, oh, by the way, we now have a treaty that says that there's a human right to a healthy environment. Now you're going to do something about it, aren't you? No. If the environment is linked to human rights, many of the polluters are going to be delighted with that because they don't think anything about human rights now would give them an excuse to call this uh, yet another example of, of Western or Northern overreach. Um, and it simply would be counterproductive. So again, I mean, it may be that today, and I'm almost convinced of this, that the environment is the single most important issue that we face, at least after we get rid of the COVID virus. That doesn't mean that it has to be linked to human rights. And human rights law, human rights understanding doesn't help us to know what to do about the environment because it is so, so complex. Uh, it's not like fair trials. It's not even like economic and social rights, like, um, like the right to health or the right to education. I mean, those are of course very broad concepts, but I think they're manageable in identifying what the obligations of government should be. The environment is simply much more complicated than that. There is, I think almost, no international law on the environment. And the environment is a global issue. Human rights have a global scope, but they respond to and impose obligations on individual sovereign states within their sovereignty, or at least within their jurisdiction. So again, it just seems to me that there's, there's too great a difference. Um, we have so much more to do on the environment um, that the little drop in the bucket that calling it a human right will add uh, isn't worth, I think, um, the danger that it becomes held up as an example of yet another issue that human rights cannot deal with, and therefore another example of human rights failure. Yeah. Thank you. And we were talking before, and you were saying you sometimes get pushback from students on the issues of uh... The, the way you have discussed right to the environment um, and human rights as applied to business. And I'm just wondering what, 
what kind of objections would would be most common um, when when students take issue with that? I suppose they're writing dissertations and pieces that they need to defend, but presumably feel passionate about those. And how do you deal with those? Well, I would tell students to become environmentalists, yeah, or to become economists, mm -hmm. uh, or you know to do something that's directly relevant. <laughs> Yeah, to yeah. the inequities in the world. Yeah. Uh, rights are part of that. And there's there are issues of discrimination uh, and the failure to deliver rights equitably education would be a perfect example. Mm -hmm. Health in the time of COVID is, COVID is a perfect example. But you don't do that first by looking at these things through the lens of rights because rights can't help you come up with the solutions. Mm -hmm. What rights do, I think, in most cases, is to provide a context in which these solutions can be openly discussed and in which we can reach agreement on some of these solutions. There rarely is a single option. There's no magic wand that's going to fix the environment or that's going to make business behave, um, but it's going to be the corporate lawyers and the, and the environmentalists and the biologists who are going to solve these sorts of things. And human rights can help. And they, as they should, as I say, be there as sort of a, all these solutions should be found in the shadow of human rights, shall we say. Mm, yeah. But it's only in the shadows. Yeah, that sounds very reasonable. Um, so I have, I suppose, two more questions. The first, I was really interested in chapter seven, where you speak about this concept, this age old concept of the universality of human rights um, and how that's distinct, I suppose, from regional variations. And this is a debate that's gone on for an awfully long time and continues to rage, as you know. Um, I'm particularly interested in the UN International Human Rights Treaty monitoring mechanisms and the challenges that they face and potential reforms of those institutions. But so I thought this would be a good opportunity to talk about the difference between implementation um, of human rights domestically versus their enforcement as Law. So is there anything you, you wanted to, to tease out in relation to chapter seven and the, the universality versus cultural relativism debate? Well, I think the universality versus relativism uh, dichotomy has been around since the beginning of human rights. Yeah. And I felt obliged in writing this chapter to attempt to identify basic rights or more fundamental rights. And I failed miserably. Yeah. Um, and the, the answer that I came up with is that yes, human rights are universal, but no, this doesn't imply that they're going to be, mean exactly the same thing uh, in every culture in the world or in every country in the world. Um, human rights are very different from cultures and there was never any desire on the part of the drafters to turn every culture into who knows what. Where you draw those lines, is extremely difficult. Most of the human rights bodies, whether they're the regional courts like the European Court of Human Rights or the treaty bodies that are set up under the UN um, are not particularly good at explaining always how they draw those lines. The European court falls down on the margin of appreciation. Um, the uh, Human Rights Committee, for instance, rejects that and tends to come out with these grand pronouncements about human rights being the same everywhere. One of the underlying difficulties of human rights is that they rely on the existing system of sovereign states. They impose their obligations on these states and they were developed by these states. And so with the exception of the three regional courts, um, each of which has serious problems with implementation, and with compliance with judgments, they didn't establish um, a, a global human rights court. This makes a big difference um, in many respects. And one of the differences that has come through, at least to me in looking at, not all by any means, but much of the jurisprudence or the commentary by the various human rights committees is that they don't very often tell us what human rights are, the human rights that they are designed to protect or to oversee. 
they tell us what way they think the human rights should be. Mm. They tend to offer relatively expansive definitions of what, I don't know, a fair trial is, or the right to health is, or the right to education is. And that fits with their lack of any sort of binding authority to actually tell states what to do. All they can do is to recommend things to states. Mm. The periodic reports that states file are discussed in a constructive dialogue with the committee. Mm. I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't say this in, in order to be critical, but it's very different from a court trying to decide a particular case in front of it. Now, of course, the committees do have some um, powers in that respect too, but even there, all they can do is technically to issue their views about a certain case, not to issue a judgment. I think that allows them to engage in that dialogue. I think dialogue is essential. And I think the final part of this dichotomy is for human rights advocates, the international advocates of which are primarily based in the West, although there are tens of thousands of domestic human rights advocates uh, doing wonderful work around the world. But it at least should remind the international advocates that their view of the way human rights should be interpreted is not always the only view. And it comes back earlier to that quote from, I have to look up his name again, uh, James Griffin, um, about morality not being the same as rights. And when we think about human rights and developing new human rights, and I assume that new human rights will develop, be developed over time, we have to at least pause and think, are these proposals that we have likely to have a chance of truly being universal? And often the answer to that is, oh, well, no, it's really what we want here in Sweden or it's really what we want here in Brazil. But no, this is fairly, we need to put this into domestic law. We need to get a political campaign or a social campaign to change this or that in our own society. And I think that because human rights advocates have tended to maximize rather than minimize the scope of human rights, they have fallen into the trap of which they've been accused for the last 70 years, which is imposing largely Northern Western European or American values on the rest of the world. I don't think that's a legitimate objection. Um, in most cases, it's one that's used primarily by repressive governments. But I think it's a, a more, a somewhat more persuasive objection today than it was 20 or 30 years ago. Um, I, I was really keen to talk to you about chapter nine and um, your discussion of the role of the United States and human rights, and then to talk in that context about the Biden administration and how that might um, affect human rights and the role of the US in the international system going forward. Um, but I'm just thinking about the time, and I, I think this is, this is something that will come up in the Q&A, um, probably regularly enough. So if it's okay with you, we'll talk about that in the Q&A. And for now, I might just bring in uh, one of our PhD students, uh, Ursula Quill, who is here at Trinity College with us and researching the impact of deliberative democracy on constitutional reform with a particular focus on the change to abortion law in Ireland. She's also training to be a barrister at the King's Inn and has worked as a political assistant um, in the Irish Parliament for seven years. So first, I'm going to promote you to a panelist so that you can ask your question directly to Professor Hannum. Hi. Thank you, Donna, and um, thank you, Professor Hurst. Um, uh, it's very, very good to, to see you. Um, sure. Thank you very much for your, 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 your introductory remarks. Um, uh, will I jump in, Donna, uh, with my with my remarks? Yeah, it actually follows on very nicely from, I suppose, what we were touching on there. And in particular, my my research is looking at the, the 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 impact of deliberative democracy on constitutional reform, and in particular, mm -hmm. the impact on on political institutions and how they respond to more civic engagement. So, in particular, we've had in Ireland the Constitutional uh, Convention on Marriage Equality and then on, mm -hmm. on abortion rights. And I suppose two, two kind of major examples internationally of how 
engaging with, with a, a civil society body and how that could influence the, the political um, uh, body in terms of changing uh, the constitution, but, but both in, in, in terms of uh, for, through a human rights lens as well. And I suppose I, I was very, really interested and very struck by your, your remark that, that human rights not human rights is not the same as morality and also that it's not um human rights isn't everything so it's not the it's not the tool to fix everything and yet I was I was I was wondering if you could perhaps elaborate a little bit more on I suppose where where do you see politics and democracy in particular fitting in in the in in this rescuing of human rights which I think we were, we're all on board with in terms of rescuing human rights and where do you see because as I see it, you're very much seeing it in, in terms of, in terms of um, legal solutions. But where do you see political institutions and democratic institutions fitting in there, in particular where, where human rights might evolve from, a from, from the political side? And um, yeah, that, that relationship, because I suppose that division is sometimes not quite so clear, in particular where uh, the courts and the judiciary might show a lot of deference to the decisions made by by political institutions, mm -hmm. so sometimes that that division isn't isn't as easily made uh, where um, where where the, where the courts themselves actually defer back to the political institutions. Mm -hmm. And uh, perhaps where do you see that going into the future in terms of that relationship? Well, I'm tempted to respond with only one sentence, uh, and that would be: Remember, Donald Trump was elected democratically. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Democracy does have an impact on human rights, but it's not always positive. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, since you mentioned abortion, um, I find that to be in some ways a paradigm of how human rights should work. I mean, the human rights bodies generally seem to me to have decided that abortion wasn't much of their business, <laughs> but they've turn down arguments that uh, every woman has a right to an abortion at any time she wants one. And they have almost equally, but not quite, except recently for the Inter-American Court, and as you know better than I, turned down the argument that banning abortion is always a, a violation of human rights. I could never understand for decades why no one from Ireland ever brought a case uh, on abortion to the European Court of Human Rights. There simply wasn't an Irish lawyer around. And so you muddled through with information and oh, you can always go to England, so maybe that's not so bad. And it was domestic social and moral and political changes that drove uh, Ireland to the, I wouldn't say particularly liberal, but the certainly much more uh, reasonable uh, place that it is today. We all need to learn how to abstain from asking too much of human rights because, and I'm sure this must have been true in, in, in Ireland, I mean, the Catholic Church simply has to say, what's Strasbourg doing telling us what to do? This is part of our moral fiber. Human rights from democracy can be progressive also. Sweden has an avowedly feminist foreign policy now. I'm not exactly sure what that means particularly but if it's simply advancing the rights of women and the, and the place of women in society, there's certainly nothing, nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, that fits in with, I think, things that are going on at the level of the world that truly are universal. If you look at Asia and Africa, for instance, which in many ways lag behind human rights protection, uh, women in those two continents are, are extremely active in, uh, in many respects. So, it, we have to allow the democratic process um, to decide some of these issues because we should reflect national values. And I, I also have done a lot of work on nationalism and self-determination and that sort of thing over the years. I'm a great skeptic of nationalism. I'm probably even a greater skeptic of the possibility of any sort of world government. So we're left with people who want to govern themselves in a way that reflects whatever they think their values are. And their values keep changing, of course, and they tend to forget that themselves. But we need to, to leave room for that 
and not to impose very many rights or very many ethical values on the world as a whole. We have done that. And we talked about the International Criminal Court earlier. I think it is a universally accepted ethical value that genocide is a bad thing and should be prohibited and punished. Uh, I think you could say the same thing for, at the very least, institutional racial discrimination. Um, I think that you could, you're beginning to see that for equality for women, or at least true non-discrimination for women in the public sphere, not in the private sphere. That's going, that's going to take another few generations in, country, in some countries to change. So democracy can push us forward, but we need still to allow societies to figure out their own way forward and their own pace at going forward. That's why I do keep coming back to law and government, not because they're the most important things in the world, but that in itself is a way of limiting the reach of human rights. Um, and I think that's important. And it does return things to those who want to be good nationalists instead of intolerant nationalists to decide what it is they want to do in their societies without transgressing the fundamental norms, whether they're constitutional norms or international human rights norms. That's where the tension comes in. And those are always difficult questions, but I think in that context, international human rights norms can prove to be something of a check to the the Trumps and the Orbans and the Bolsonaros of the world. Thank you very much for that response, mm -hmm. Professor Hannum. And um, if I could just have a very, very briefly respond. Um, interestingly, as, as late as, as, as 2012, a number of, of key cases were taken by, by Irish women um, regarding the Irish abortion law to the uh, European Court of Human Rights. And I think probably in the, you know, in the history of, of the change in abortion law, I think certainly that only one of them was successful, but I think it certainly would, would be put into the, the composite mix of what, what ultimately mm -hmm. changed the, the policy's position on, on the law that, I suppose having the international eyes and and the idea that that Ireland could be reprimanded internationally from a human rights court, I think certainly did have an impact. So certainly, I think I think it was there as an important part of the mix in changing in changing the law, along with I suppose as as you put it, and um, uh, the idea that that the the the, the, the nation that itself had to decide what what it what it wanted to change. So I think it was that balance between um, between both the international and the national. I'm glad you mentioned much. that because that, those initiatives are very important. And mm -hmm. when you're dealing with Ireland rather than Brazil, they're even more important. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm glad that you also, who know much more about it than I do, think that those were worthwhile initiatives. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ursula, and thanks for your response, Professor Hannum. Um, we have um, Dr. Tamil Benton Anan Tavanayagan with us today, who um, did his LLM in Maastricht University and his PhD in NUI Galway, and is a teaching associate and lecturer at the University of Nottingham. Tamil, how are you? Go ahead. Not too bad. Thanks very much. I hope you hear me very clearly. Yep, perfect. Uh, Yes. So thanks, thanks very much, uh, Donna, um, for the invite and for um, leading this conversation. And um, thank you very much, Professor Hannum. Um, it's my great privilege. I think um, one of my first peer, re peer review journals um, articles that I wrote very much uh, used your insights uh, on nationalism and self-determination. Oh, uh, when I wrote an article about Tamils and um, remedial secession. So I, I use very much your thoughts uh, for that uh, um, article. So well, uh, I spent a bit of time in Sri Lanka many years ago attempting to do something of value there. I don't think I did, but um, it's, it's an interesting country where human rights and self-determination issues don't help each other much, but they're yeah. both very important. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, it's a hackless task, uh, I think. Um, I'm not sure what will happen there in Sri Lanka in any time soon. Um, but again, you know, my immense privilege. I have 
you know, usually a plethora of questions. So I, I will try to restrict me to two and be very precise and concise as good as, as I can, Professor Hannum, um, to let you know at the very forefront, um, I belong to a scholarship which is called the Third World Approaches to International Law, uh, TWIL, um, which you are familiar with. Um, and my first question would be, um, against the background of chapter four that you wrote, uh, human rights is considered to be a neoliberal tool to further a particular agenda of Western states. And there is one book um, that probably you've heard and read of, it's The Morals of the Market by Jessica White. And she writes one uh, sentence here. She, she says, human rights played an important role in the neoliberal attempt to develop an appropriate legal system, a moral framework for a global capitalist system. Um, you say in chapter four, um, we need to be a realistic idealist um, to uh, uh, redefine, revision human rights. So my first question would be, how would that be? How do we navigate human rights in a neoliberal world? The second question, against the background of chapter seven uh, that you wrote, uh, again, here I'm using a Macau Mutua from the Twilight Movement. Um, Macau Mutua wrote also his famous, I, I have it somewhere here, human book on human rights. Um, he uses the uh, savages uh, victim savior um, uh, metaphor, but he makes a more important point in that book. And um, this ties into chapter seven that you wrote, um, namely the multi, the multi narratives, let's put it that way, the multi narratives of different cultural backgrounds that can contribute in the corpus of human rights. To what extent do you think that can be achieved? And I'm saying this as, you know, a person who, who has this Tamil narrative in, him, in himself, but also as someone who was born and raised in Germany. Uh, there are different narratives that are playing in my own body. Mm -hmm. And how can we actually create a narrative that feeds into one coherent um, body of different cultural narratives of human rights? If, if these two questions make sense. Um, and I have a third one. I keep it to myself to a later Q&A, okay? <laughs> well, as Donna has already discovered, I tend to give long answers to very short questions, uh, but I'll attempt to, uh, to keep it reasonable at this stage. Yeah. Um, I guess my first response would be that you are never going to find a unitary coherent narrative that explains human rights any more that you can find a unitary coherent narrative that explains most constitutions. Um, it's simply, there's simply too much there. Uh, human rights does make, or human rights institutions make decisions on very precise issues the way because it's based on the the case system um, but there's a lot of space in there it comes back to our discussion on universality versus versus relativism mm -hmm. um, remember to come back to to twail and I'm somewhat familiar with it although not much uh, remember that the first and most important human rights issue in the world between 1945 and 1965, was decolonization. Mm. That was a human rights issue. Yeah. And so while it may be true now, let's say that the, your, your quote, I tried to write it down, that human rights now is a new legal attempt to justify global capitalism. A more accurate quotation would be that it was a new interpretation of human rights designed mm. to justify global legal capitalism in the same way that there was an interpretation uh, that actually was used and used successfully uh, mm. by anti-colonialist uh, uh, movements uh, in the 50s and 60s. You should, I, I hesitate to, uh, to plug yet another review of my book, but since you pose the question, I think it would only be honest to suggest that you read um, a, the most recent review of the book, which is in the American Journal of International Law. It just came out a couple of weeks ago. And it's by Henry Richardson, uh, who's a well-known uh, law professor at Temple University, 
who, if he's not a member of Twail, would certainly be sympathetic to it. Mm. And his review uh, criticizes the book on, in, on Twail grounds, I would say. He's also very complimentary in some ways, at least to the degree of, uh, of, uh, of facts and, uh, and analysis in the book. And my response is similar to the response I've given to some, several other of these conflation, conflation issues. Mm. And that is that human rights, given that it's focused on the rights of individuals within states, and I say individuals, that includes groups too, I mean, minorities or ethnic groups, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. But individuals within states and the rights and obligations of their governments vis-a-vis -vis them. Mm. That just doesn't have too much to do with international capitalism. Mm. It's irrelevant to international capitalism. The responsibility is on the individual government not to do things uh, that will hurt the people under their jurisdiction. Mm. And if that is joining a trade treaty, then they shouldn't join the treaty. If it's not joining the trade treaty, then they should not join the, trade, the, the treaty. And I'm not, I'm neither an economist nor an expert in trade law. Mm. Uh, with all due respect, I suspect that that's true for most of the people in Twail, or many people at least. Mm -hmm. um, the second response I suppose I would give is that we have human rights. I mean, they're there. And they weren't handed down on golden tablets. They're not going to be the same for the next 50 years. They can and should be changed and reinterpreted as they, as they have been. But let's start there. And I guess this is more of an overall not disagreement, but, but caveat about the a third world approach to international law. Mm. International law was developed by old white men and by the colonial powers. That's simply a fact of history. Repeating that over and over again, now I know I'm getting myself in trouble, um, isn't very helpful. What is helpful, and I would say the same about a, a feminist approach to international law, is saying how a modern approach that does have come from a universal mm. contribution is going to be different. What needs to be changed? It's not enough just to say, we weren't around when this was done. It's an absolutely fair criticism. It's an accurate statement. But I don't mm. think that everything that the old white guys did was bad. A mm. lot of it was, and there certainly has been a lot of misinterpretation there is today about how human rights should play into the larger international context of, of trade and of politics. Every government in the world uses human rights for political purposes, whether to advance them or to try to slow them down. So that's nothing new. And what my hope is, um, is that as the human rights discussion expands, both at the non-governmental and at the governmental level, mm that that debate will be much more focused, which will talk about things like the media or what education means mm -hmm. or how to have a more, not just a non-discriminatory society, but a more equitable society. Mm -hmm. um, those things need input from, from all over the world, from many different societies and approaches, because nobody has the answer. Lots of people have some answers, and I think that's what we need to, to, to look for. Mm -hmm. So I think that contributions by, by people like Macau uh, mm -hmm. have been very important. They've made uh, those of us who are old white guys, older all the time, um, realize something we probably realized anyway, but that this was a, a somewhat limited uh, small group of people mm. back in the 1940s through the 1960s. Although again, to come back to decolonization, Article 1 is in the two covenants because of the impact of the, of the developing world, mm. of the former colonies. So you can't pretend that they weren't there. Mm. They were. The fact is they didn't care too much about human rights other than independence, mm. which is perfectly understandable from a, from a political point of view. It was the thing that had to come first. Mm. Um, but just saying that isn't enough. So I would encourage you and others to continue the conversations mm. 
Mm. But to me, to be really much more direct and much less full of jargon mm. in the discussions. Yeah. Um, I mean, and it's not just Twail that does that. There have been lots of other international legal approaches to things over the world that were incomprehensible to anyone who wasn't already initiated into the fraternity. Mm. Um, and I hope Twail doesn't end up being that because it can be much more. And particularly on the human rights area, it's what's missing. What do we really need now? And what, if anything, is wrong? And I'm sure there are some things in the human rights corpus as we have it now that simply, simply should be changed. I mean, it's, most of it is at least 50 years old, um, but I haven't seen any of that. And that may be my fault because I don't read as widely as I should. Trouble is when you start to specialize in something as an academic, you end up in not reading all these other interesting things. Yeah. But that's where I would hope the conversation would go. Not that it would stop at all. Not that one should simply accept what we have now. But if that would happen, I think uh, human rights would be much richer 20 or 30 years from now. Mm. Thank you so much, Tamo. You're welcome. Thank you so much for your uh, response, Professor Hanum. It's fascinating. Um, and there are plenty of questions in the q and I'll try not to, to run over time, but um, just to start off, we will take a question from, and we might tie the theme of this into any ideas um, or comments you wanted to make on human rights in the Biden administration, because there is a reference in this question to uh, the role of the US. So I'll just read it out. So from Gonka Sonmez Pool, I hope I'm uh, pronouncing that correctly. My question refers to Professor Hannum's thoughts on page 169, the danger of excessive dependence on US and or the EU when applying pressure on governments with human rights issues, because that type of method would only exacerbate allegations of neo-colonialism. Um, could you please expand on that and comment if there's some kind of balance or sweet spot, if, if you will, when it comes to applying outside pressure with that of local and domestic work on human rights inside the country in question. I think that ties in with what you were saying uh, just, just a, a moment ago. Any thoughts on that? Uh, well, let me first say hello to Goncha, yet another former student and, and good friend. Um, the book was written during the time of Trump in the, the early days. Uh, but as I said, the, its genesis goes back to actually about the time that Obama was running for president. And so the concerns that it raises uh, are not direct, will not directly be addressed by the Biden administration. And so let me just say a couple of words about that first. Have low expectations. I mean, I think that, that Joe Biden will do what he can to overturn um, the bad things that Trump has done. That's not a small task, but it can be accomplished. Uh, the US will go back into the, the Human Rights Council. Human rights will become a meaningful part of foreign policy. To me, the danger is that Biden will do no more than go back to Obama in human rights terms, which in some ways reflects what Obama did, which was simply to go back to Clinton in human rights terms. Those aren't bad things. I think Obama was a wonderful president. I think Joe Biden is going to be a very good president. But my whole, my whole call for rescuing human rights is to rethink some of the things that, that we're doing. Um, part of that rethinking will be to see how human rights best fit into foreign policy, not just of the US, but of all countries. Um, I do think it's a danger that if we push only our own concerns, and in Western Europe and the United States, this is primarily women and LGBTQ and democracy. Those are the three issues that all countries seem to raise. That's all we talk about uh, to Turkey or to Brazil or to the Philippines. Yeah, yeah uh, they'll, they'll listen. Um, but that a meaningful human rights policy has to be much more focused on the target. Uh, much of human rights policy reflects democracy. The US cares about LGBT um, issues because there's a lobby in the United States. 
and is vocal. And the US has made a lot of progress on these issues. Uh, Sweden has a feminist foreign policy because that's what its society feels. But too often foreign policy ends up reflecting only the domestic constituencies that support it without enough thought being given to how effective a particular initiative is, is going to be. Um, I offer as the counter example, China, which has spent the last at least 10 years and probably a bit more trying to substitute the notion of development for human rights. And it's, it's had a concerted, well-organized campaign that pretends that its view of human rights, and maybe it's not even a pretense, uh, which takes the ordinary person in, in, into account, the, the urban slum dweller, the peasant, who talks about, that talks about subsistence and getting ahead and trying to be, not to be concerned with individual rights that may cause dissension, but to be concerned with the common good, with harmony. Well, if one knows China, one knows that these are code words for things that are antithetical to human rights, not just complementary to them. And so I do think it's important to let human rights be political, to let them enter into um, international affairs and foreign relations. But I think we just need to be smarter uh, in terms of how we do that. Uh, we can't expect any government to take on a human rights initiative in foreign affairs to push an issue on which it doesn't have domestic support. I mean, there's no reason it would do that. Um, but it can, I think most governments that take human rights seriously can do a better job. And certainly the EU and the US uh, fall into this category in trying to tailor their initiatives to achieve tangible results in real countries, as opposed to issuing yet another pronouncement on the wonders of democracy or the wonders of something else that's popular within their own constituency. Thank you. Um, just conscious of the time, would you like me to call out one or two more questions or should I copy them over to you via email and maybe we'll take them up another time? Um, I'm, I'm happy to go another few minutes if you want, sure. Over, okay. Um, I'll take one from an anonymous attendee, which just ties into what we were speaking about just now. Um, could Professor Hannum, oh, sorry, 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 now, uh, do you think the US should rejoin the Human Rights Council or do you see the Human Rights Council as fun a fundamentally flawed institution such that US human rights efforts should be pursued in other ways? And one more question from... Alistair Richardson, who asks, does Professor Hannum think that Magnitsky laws imposed by national governments using national laws have the potential to do a better job of holding those responsible for crimes accountable than international criminal law has done? Um, and we'll, we'll see how much time we have, but um, feel okay. free to just, just take one of those if you're, if you're more comfortable rather than both. Um, I can probably deal with with the first one quickly, and that is that the Human Rights Council is a flawed institution. Uh, it's part of the UN, it's highly politicized. And yes, the United States should rejoin it because it's important. Um, it's, it would be useful if it were possible to, I'm gonna sound like Joe Biden now, to seek greater consensus uh, as opposed to tit for tat. We have a new special rapporteur on this is, oh, well, in that case, we're going to have a new special rapporteur on that, too. We now have about 50 of them, and that's plenty. Uh, but nonetheless, you can't just stay away and then complain about the, uh, the rules of the game. Yeah. Um, in terms of criminal law, of course, it would be better if uh, those who commit international crimes would be punished domestically. And that's what's happened primarily with, when people who talk about accountability for human rights violations, uh, not genocide or crimes against humanity, but for things like uh, destroying political parties, uh, torturing and, and killing uh, and kidnapping children in, in Argentina and Chile uh, decades ago. Those crimes have been dealt with not always immediately, but ultimately 
through domestic accountability for violating domestic laws. It strikes me that that is by far the, the best way to move forward. Um, criminal accountability isn't always the only way. And that's where, uh, again, I would, personally, I would probably tend to look for criminal accountability if it were my country. But I feel uncomfortable in saying to every country in the world that their concerns, for instance, about upsetting a peace agreement through criminal accountability are entirely unfounded and that there's some international norm that requires criminal accountability. I don't think that international norm exists. Um, one of the bad, uh, maybe just one example of the, what can happen if you don't have international criminal law is what happened um, in the United States, first with the torture uh, after 9-11 that was approved by George W. Bush. And then the decision uh, by President Obama within his first few days in office, not to investigate or prosecute any of those allegations. Some had already been investigated uh, because it was necessary for the country to heal. That's exactly what dictators say all over the world. And I'm not saying that Obama was a dictator, he certainly wasn't. But I'm saying that, and I don't think it was the right decision. It was a very disappointing decision. But that's where we can at least have international opinion, if not international criminal accountability, uh, to stand as a check against that sort of willingness to ignore things that are politically uncomfortable for you at home. Thank you so much. Um, and we don't have time for any more questions, but just briefly to note that there are lots of really interesting ones and I'll copy them across. Thanks to Blano Car Carney for your question on the environment and to Alan Eustace for your question on labour law and Michael O'Boyle asking about sporting bodies and lots of other anonymous attendees wanting to weigh in there. So um, really engaged audience. Thank you so much for that. So we're coming to the end of our session now. Thank you so much to Professor Hannum for enlightening discussions uh, and observations. It's an absolutely fascinating book. I really would recommend it to everybody um, to read. Um, Professor Hannum, you're such an influential thinker and a prolific scholar, as well as a principled and a highly effective practitioner. And this book does touch on important issues relating to contemporary geopolitics, social goals and human rights, and couldn't be more timely. Um, so I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to you for sharing these valuable insights with the college community and beyond. Is there anything else you would like to say before we wrap up? Just to say thank you to you, Donna, for uh, conducting a wonderful interview. Uh, a good interview is always more the responsibility of the interviewer than the person being asked the questions. And it's, it's always, since you did such a thorough review of the book, I knew you would know what you were talking about, and in fact, you did. Uh, and again, this is a this is a discussion that can and should go on forever. Uh, I'm not always noted for my humility, but I confess that I don't know if all the things that I suggest in the book are correct. What I am convinced by, though, is that as you just said, the questions are important, and so I would simply uh, appeal to everyone out there not to agree with everything I say. But at least I hope agree that these are important issues that you all are going to need to talk about over the next 5, 10, and 20 years. So I hope you do. And uh, I look forward to seeing what the outcome of those discussions will be. Thank you again so much, Chris. It was an absolute pleasure. And hopefully we can take this up again soon. So with that, I'll okay. close the session. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Okay, bye.